thanks for coming today and thanks for sticking around. Um, I know this is really a hot button topic lately, um, you know, with all that's been going on in the world. Unfortunately, um, the way the world's going, it is a hot button topic. Um, you know, if you would have told me 15 years ago I'd be in front of a congregation, um, I'd be doing this at a daycare center, I'd be doing this at a, at a, at a you know, anything, you know, like this, I, I would have told you you were crazy, but, uh, you know, unfortunately in the world we live in, um, we have to do stuff like this. What we want you to get from this program, it's gonna, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna be brief with it. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I will be here afterwards. Or if you have any questions you wanna ask, just raise your hand while I'm going through the presentation. Um, like I said, we're, we're trying to get this out to as many entities as we can in the township. Uh, I was just telling the people over here that I was, I'm doing about four or five of these a month, uh, whether it be churches, uh, places of business, schools, daycares, um, basically anyone who wants the information, we want it to be out. Uh, for them to have. Um, the program is designed to tell you what to do before we get there um, and, and how to take a loss of life from a possible high number to a much lower number. Now, um, and, and like you said, we're going to be working with the church on uh, some security items um, just so that when you do come here, there's less to worry about. And, and we're going to work with the church, and, and then what we, we want people to realize is. You need to think. Think about this stuff, unfortunately. Um, and if it does happen, we need you to know what to do. Not when it, if it does happen, not knowing what to do. So like I said, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. That's me. That's my dog. As you can see, but if you get close, you can see all the dog hair on my uniform. So I'm going to stay up here where you can't see it and report back to my chief that I have a lot of dog hair on my uniform. So I'm a canine handler. I've been a canine handler for 16 years. Um, I'm also the department's training instructor. Um, and I'm in charge of training all the guys here uh, in the department. I'm also a police academy firearms instructor. I teach uh, defensive tactics and firearms to police cadets. The question is, how many children have been killed by a fire while at a school in the past 50 years in North America? The answer is zero in the past 50 years. And, and why is that? How many students and faculty were murdered in the school in the United States in one year? The answer is 59 murders in a school in only one year. Uh, shocking numbers. For the first time since 1992 and 2007, the rate for violent crime at a school was higher than the rate experienced away from school. Um, so that's why we sort of got into this. And the reason being, after the Our Lady of Angels school fire disaster, firefighters became very aggressive towards fire prevention and mitigation. Meaning, the Our Lady of uh, Angels school fire, 95 students, or 92 students and three nuns passed away. So what firefighters decided to do was they decided to get very active so that this never, ever happened again. If you, go to, if you have children in school, they do a fire drill once a month, at least once a month they're required to do a fire drill. So the question was is why weren't police officers getting more involved based on those statistics of the violent crime in school districts? So what we did was I was always focused on training police what to do. If there's a shooter in a building, what, what should they do? What should police do when they respond? But what we weren't focusing on was training people in the building what to do before we get there. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So this program, like I said, in the past five years, I'm doing tons of these programs everywhere. And I'm glad because we want, to know, we want you to know what to do before we get there. We want you to know what to do once we get there. Active shooting cases are mostly about power and control. Power and control. They want, they want to have the power at these things, and they want to have control. They want to say where it happens, they want to say when it happens, and how it ends. In most cases, they want to say how it ends, because it's all about power and control. A lot of times, they'll choose their targets based on least resistance, meaning you know, when you look at Sandy Hook, it's an elementary school. When you look at uh, the Amish schoolhouse, less resistance. They're not picking targets. I've worked at a gun shop for 23 years. We've never been robbed, all right? So the, they pick their targets based on the least amount of resistance. And we had discussed this with churches and houses of worship where you don't know who's carrying a, a firearm in a church. Nobody broadcasts that they're carrying a firearm in church, but it's that unknown that prevents them from possibly attacking a church. 
It's the unknown because they don't have the power. They don't have the control. That's why they're choosing targets that are, are they're going to get the least amount of resistance. In most American communities, the local high school is the most occupied building. Not so here in Hershey, right? We have a lot of entertainment facilities. We have a lot of, uh, you know, you, you have the, the largest, one of the largest employers in the area, the, the Hershey Medical Center. And then even on Sundays. Obviously, everything's closed on Sundays in the mornings except churches. So where would a most occupied building be on a Sunday if, if someone does decide to do these attacks? It would be in a church. This one was tough for me uh, when I first started teaching this, you know, because we're always like, hey, don't worry, the police will be there for you. We'll get there as fast as we can and we'll solve the problem. But what we're saying is don't count on the police to rescue you before you get killed. And we're going to talk about some ways you can do that, some things you can do that if it does happen, you don't help participate, help, help the gunman uh, with getting his higher body count. There again, if it can happen in a one-room Amish schoolhouse, it can happen here. There again, I, I get a lot of answers on this, a lot of questions on this. What is the current procedure on a violent intruder? Do you have a, does anyone know if we have a procedure in the, in, the, in the church for a violent intruder? Don't worry, I get that a lot. Everyone looks at each other and goes, do you know, do you know? <laughs> I get a lot of head turning. All right, I get a lot of head turning. But what we're, what we're going to do with this is we're going we're gonna to take, uh, sort of take this away from a procedure and give the people who have the most to lose, which are you guys, an option to do if it does happen here. The church is putting together procedures. I, I saw a procedure book and was reviewing some of the stuff in the, in the church procedure for if there's an intruder, if there's a medical emergency, or if there's a fire emergency. I, um, and we're looking at that stuff, and then we'll work together with everyone um, to try to round that off to, to make it a little easier uh, for the people in it, that work here or volunteer here, and then also for you guys. There again, a lot of places have a lockdown procedure. Are there any other options you have if an intruder comes into the building? The practice drill I usually do, uh, and I won't do it today, uh, but a lockdown, schools, use, schools used to do a traditional lockdown where they lock their door to the classroom and all the kids would huddle in a corner and wait for the police to get there or, and hope that the bad guy doesn't get through the door. Um, so what I normally do with the practice drill is I'll say, okay, you two rows are, are, are involved in this, show me a lockdown, and everyone, they lock the door and they get in the corner. What we're doing, what we found is, is if you do that and you, everybody huddles in a corner and the shooter does get through the door, how hard is it for him to hit targets? How hard, you know, and what I'll do is I'll, everyone will get in the corner in a lockdown and I'll have a bag of tennis balls and I'll turn my head away from them and just start throwing tennis balls into the corner. How many people do you think I hit? A lot of people. A lot of people without looking. So what we're doing is we're training people not to participate in this guy's plans. We're teaching people what to do if it does happen. Don't just everybody huddle in the corner and wait for the police to get there. The Alice program is the one we teach here in the township. Um, you'll see, this is uh, students take cover in French class in Holden Hall, Virginia Tech, next to the carn carnage at Norris Hall. They were trained to do a traditional lockdown. Now, if the gunman made it out of that first building and made it to the second building and got it into this classroom, how hard would it have been for him to hit any of those targets? It would have been pretty easy, right? And you'll even see the teacher, she was under the impression it was another one of these stupid drills and continued teaching. And in the building next door, 32 people were killed. Instead of these people probably doing what they should have done, getting out of the building, because if you're not there, he can't kill you, they locked the door, everybody huddled together in the front of the classroom, and they continued teaching. So that's why we really stress that if, if something does happen or you guys do have a drill here at a certain time, that you take it seriously and you know, try to be as realistic as it can. The ALICE program, it stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. And we'll go over each one of these briefly. There again, we're not changing anything about your procedure. Matter of fact, you guys are, are sort of ahead of the game because of some of the security measures that the church has put into place. Um, 
you know, when I came in, I reviewed with some of the volunteers, They're, they have portable radios available so that if something happens on one floor, they can put the word out and, and get that alert. That's that first part, that alert, is set, putting out the alert so that if something's happening downstairs, people upstairs know what's happening and they can start sounding the alarm. And then lockdown, meaning uh, some doors actually around here are able to be locked or secured. There again, how is an alert initiated in your building? Um, here in the church, it's, it's initiated through that radio system. Uh, there's a lot of portable, I'm not sure how many portable radios that there are, uh, but there, there's, a, there's a quite a few. And they're, they're spread out through different floors and different people have them, whether it be person coming in the front door or, or throughout the building. But that's how an alert would be initiated in the building, was someone would get on the radio and say, this is going on. If a person sees an individual outside their window with a weapon, who do they call? There again, they'd either contact the main office or 911 or somebody get on the radio and say, look, there's a man with a firearm approaching the building or there's a man with a firearm in the building. And what we're saying is when you sound that alert, we, we're sort of getting away from codes. Um, you know, code green, code blue, code yellow. Um, I, I always use this story and they always, I'll tell you why in a second. The Hershey Free Church, um, I went there and did this presentation. It was a great turnout just like you guys. And I, I said, how's an alert initiated in your building? And this one gentleman raises his hand and says, uh, one of us gets on the radio and we say, Harry Wolf. And I sort of got the puzzled look like you guys have. And I'm sort of like, I'm not sure what that means. So my next question was, is, how many of you know that if somebody got on the PA system or got on the radio and said Harry Wolf, what that would mean? And like out of the 200 people that were there, like three people raised their hand. Huh? The com yeah, the committee, the committee basically, the committee that had that book and put it together raised their hand. Right, the three people that put that book together that no one else has ever looked at raised their hand. But, so every Christmas I get, a, and I'm, I'm sitting, well that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard, you know, I've never heard of a code word named Harry Wolf. So every year at Christmas they send me a Christmas card that's, you know, Hershey Free Church, love Harry Wolf at the bottom. So, so I, I always get a Christmas card, it's been five years I've been getting Christmas cards from them, and Harry Wolf every year. So, but the point being is, is to keep it plain English. Keep it plain English. Don't, don't say a code blue, because if you've got a new person here who's never read, who's not a committee member that's read that book, and they hear code blue, they're just going to go about their business because they don't think it concerns them. So what we're saying is if, if an alert is put out through the building, the people with the most need to know are the people inside the building. So keep it plain and simple. If you, know, if you see somebody outside the building, you know, don't, you know, if you know the codes, don't come in and say code green. You know, get on the radio and say, there's a man with a gun approaching the building. And that sends that alert out. And the minute that alert comes out, we're letting the people in the building know, and we're also letting, we're also having someone contact 911 and get the police on the way. And there again, the alerts communicated to the rest of the building for, through here, through uh, your portable radio system. There again, we just talked about this. By adding one sentence, we inform the occupants of the reason and the location of the action. Um, by doing this, we address the issue of exactly who is in imminent danger and who is not. This allows the good decision-making process for everyone to begin based on good information. Lockdown. The concept of lockdown originated in prisons. It was a, quick, it was a way to quickly gain control in a riot. So when we put people in a lockdown, what are we essentially doing for the shooter? We're assisting them in gaining control. And remember, for them it's all about power and control. So what do we do? There again, name one building where a violent intruder entered the lockdown was initiated and there were no casualties. You can't because there's never been a case. So why do we keep teaching it and doing it? All the schools in this area, whether it be um, the Derry Township School Districts, Milton Hershey School, um, Hershey Christian, uh, I forget what they're called now, but Hershey Christian School. But any of those schools, they had, when we first started this program, they had a traditional lockdown. And then when we went in and showed them why it doesn't work, they switched their policies and procedures. You can easily add security to your door. There again, we, we, te we train people on how to, if someone is in the building and that door back there can't lock, how can we prevent someone from coming through that door? What security measures can we use? And if you look at that door when you go back there, there's a piston on it that, that is a V, basically. And when we did this drill at Milton Hershey, Milton Hershey School, they got all the teachers together and they put them in classrooms and they, it was actually pretty cool. They gave me an airsoft gun. And if, you don't, and if you're my age, you really didn't know what an airsoft gun was unless you have a teenage son like mine. 
but it's a BB gun that's used plastic BBs instead of the old copper ones that used to get stuck in our legs when we'd only pump, when we'd only pump it two or three times like we were supposed to, right? So they gave me an airsoft gun and they gave all their staff these, these basically face shields and protection. And we told them, look, I'm the bad guy. I have this airsoft gun. It hurts when I shoot you with it. It stings. If I get in that classroom, you're going to get shot with this airsoft gun. Well, what we did was we went in the hallway. We had all the, all the teachers in the rooms, and we, we uh, fired a blank round off, a blank rifle round off to let them know. I said, well, fire the blank round off, and you give you 15 seconds to barricade your door. It sounded like a herd of elephants uh, <laughs> down that whole hallway. Why? Because they realized that if I get in there, they're going to get shot with this BB gun. They came up with some really inventive ways to secure their doors. The, I talked about the V piston on there. One of the teachers wrapped a belt around that, and that prevented the piston from being able to expand and the person being able to get in. They took computer cords, and they secured the doors with computer cords. They tied them, tied them shut. Really, you come up with some very inventive ways when, when it's, there's a possibility you could either get hurt or killed. And I would say probably 99% of the rooms, it would have taken me a while to get through. Um, but these shooters know that they have a very limited amount of time. They have a limited amount of time from when they fire that first round to the point the police get there and they either take their own lives or, or they're, they're uh, either taken care of by the police department. So what we're trying, saying is instead of just a lockdown, instead of just turning the lock on the door and getting in the corner and hiding, we want you to take everything you can and barricade that door. We want you to put everything you can up against that door. If the door doesn't have a lock, what we want you to do is we want you to make it a mess so that if he is able to open that door and attempt to get in that room, that it's going to delay him from getting to you. So what we're saying is don't just do a turn the lock, barricade the door. Use whatever you can to make that door one big mess. Um, a lot of churches go with these floor bolts because it's a very inexpensive way uh, to secure a door. Um, it's basically a hinge on the bottom of the door and the cheapest way to do it is a piece of rebar and you drop a piece of rebar down this pin, drill a hole in the floor, and it blocks people from getting in and out of the door. So it's a very inexpensive way. A lot of daycares do that too because they really don't, this isn't supposed to be a prison. This is supposed to be a wel welcoming place for you to come and worship and serve God. So what they do is that they, they sort of keep their um, security stuff minimal but effective. So what we're saying is don't just lock down and hide in the corner. If you're, gonna, if you're stuck in a room, if the shooting's on the first floor, if you're on the second floor, obviously you're, the bottom floor, your, base, your best bet is to evacuate if you can. But you only know that based on real-time information. So obviously evacuation is the best procedure, but if you're in a room where you can't get out, we don't want you to just lock the door and wait for us to get there. We want you to lock the door and start piling as much stuff up against that door, make it a tangled mess, the biggest tangled mess you can. There's an example um, by students. Um, they, they put a bunch of desks in front of the door. You'll see that piston up there. Um, this, we, took, we took the cord off so I can get in to take the picture. But they wrapped the computer cord around that so the door couldn't expand. Um, they came up with some really inventive ways to barricade themselves in a room. And like I said, if I'm the shooter, I know I only have a certain amount of time before the police get there. I don't have time to sit and mess with one door to try to get in. I, my, my goal, if I'm a shooter, is a high body count. So I'm going in, try, trying doors, 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 and if I can't get in any of those doors, it's even better. And there again, inform, that's, that's the, provides real-time information and allows for good decision making. That's saying, if somebody gets on the radio and says, you know, and, and you guys have a camera system here, so you guys are really ahead of the game with a camera system, and you have someone that's in that camera's room monitoring it while people are here. Um, so they can provide real-time information to the people on the radios. So if I'm in here with a bunch of people and I have a radio and they're saying the shooter's on another floor, that provides me with real time good information to say, hey, maybe if he's at one end of the building, we should go out the other one and evacuate. Confuses and confounds the attacker. So what we're saying is if you have a PA system in the building, um, the first thing you do is you say, there's a man with a gun in the building and the police are on scene. Even if we're not here, what does that do to the shooter's time frame? It shortens it, right? It shortens his time frame. The occupants are the ones without that knowledge, 
and they're also the ones with the greatest need to know. There again, you guys have a very good setup downstairs for an information center where the cameras are. It's a secure location. Um, and there again, we talked about this. While it's nearly impossible to build a totally secure building other than a prison, um, you can easily build one safe room, and, that, and that's the safe room you know, that you guys have here available with the cameras so that someone's in there, and they're not only relaying to people on the radio, but they're also on 911 saying, telling the police that there's a, the intruders on this floor, the intruders on this floor, he's in front of this room, he's in, in front of that room, and they're telling us also what the intruder's wearing. They're telling us, is it a white male? Is it a black male? Hispanic male? And I say male because 97% of these active shooters are male. Um, so we're getting real-time information. So that's the camera system you guys have in effect here with a camera monitoring room, you're really ahead of the game with that. And there again, the, the room will be an information center in the event of a crisis. And there again, we, there's, already, there's already someone down there, but in a, in a crisis, pre-selected personnel re will report to that secure room. They will monitor the violent intruder's actions. They will broadcast the information as soon as possible. So that's, there again, with the camera system, you guys are really fortunate. So that if he's at one end of the building, and they're on the radio saying, he's at this end of the building, and I'm at this end of the building, they're giving real-time information to say, hey, if you're at this end of the building, you may want to evacuate because the shooter, I'm watching the shooter on camera live, and he's in this area. The information will allow people to make informed decisions for their safety. By telling everyone the violent intruder's action and movements, you allow the persons in danger to make the best possible decision for their safety. Those not in immediate area of danger have time to escape, and more importantly, they know which way, which direction to not escape to and not unintentionally run into an area of danger. So that's what, that's what these cameras, these camera system you guys have in effect, and the, someone monitoring that, those camera systems, that's very important because the people on the portable radios are now getting real-time information and saying, here's what you should or should not do. This was sort of controversial when we started. When all else fails and you're out of options, you're not able to evacuate, you're locked down in a barricaded room, and the barricade did not work, the violent intruder is now inside your room, what do you do now? And what we do is we say counter. Um, you know, there again, a church is unique because you don't really know if somebody else in the church has a firearm on them for protection. But you also, if you're in a room and you're barricaded, what we're saying is if you've barricaded, he's getting through your barricade, the police are not here yet, what should you do? And we teach this at schools, we teach this everywhere. Um, look for something field expedient, a weapon, that if he comes through that door, look in that room and say, what can I use as a weapon if, someone do, if he does make it through our barricade? If he makes it through our barricade, what can I use to defend us? Because if he gets in that room, this isn't a hostage situation, this is an active shooter situation. He's not coming in to take hostages. He's coming in to kill as many people as he can in the short amount of time he has. So what we're saying is counter. Find something. Hit him. I don't care if you hit him with a stapler. I don't care if you hit him with a laptop. My wife's purse is deadly. It's heavy. Um, she's not here, so I'm good. I can say that. <laughs> if any of you know my wife, don't tell her. Um, but, you know, think of what you can use as a field expedient weapon in that room, if I'm in that room. A lot of places, what we do is tell them to grab a fire extinguisher. You know, if there's fire extinguishers all throughout the building, if I'm in a room and, and I'm barricaded in that room and he's coming through that barricade, the minute he gets through that barricade, I'm emptying that fire extinguisher. It makes it hard for him to see, it makes it hard for him to shoot accurately, um, and there's fire extinguishers everywhere. Teachers always ask, what, what can I use as a weapon? We're not allowed to have weapons, we're not allowed to have pepper spray, we're not allowed to have guns, knives, you know, Sticks, what can I use? And I always tell them, get a fire extinguisher and put it in your room. Get a fire extinguisher and put it in your closet. I've never heard a superintendent say, we've got too many fire extinguishers in this building. <laughs> you know, all right? So, so a fire extinguisher is a great tool um, if, if you're in a room and, and that's available. You know, you're going to be empty in the fire extinguisher. You're going to take his sight and vision and have him from shooting accurately to just, you know, just sort of spraying. So, also, when the fire extinguisher is empty, what do you do with the fire extinguisher? Hit him with it. <laughs> All right? So, I mean, it's, it's sort of dual purpose. But, you know, what we're saying is if you're in that room and you're locked in and no one has a firearm, start looking around the room for, number one, barricade the door, and then number two, if he does get in here, what's going to happen? And we did this uh, at Milton Hershey School, 
And like I said, we did three drills. The one where we, tried to we told them to barricade the room, and they barricaded well. The next one was, um, again, I'm the bad guy, I don't know why. Um, but I'm the bad guy, and I got this airsoft gun. And we tell him, look, he's going to come in. This is the first classroom he's going to come into. He's going to come in each one of your classrooms, and you have to defend yourself. So we gave them tennis balls, we gave them bean bags, and we gave them these foam batons. Um, and I was the bad guy, and there was a Milton Hershey security director um, was my safety guy. So he was supposed to blow the whistle. He's supposed to blow the whistle when the fight's over. So I go in the room, and there's these two older ladies. They've got 34 and a half years on the job, and they're, they're six months away from their full out the door. And I can see them sitting there going, oh my gosh, we should have retired six months ago, right? They're nervous, because why? Because they don't want to get shot with an airsoft gun. They don't want to get shot with a, you know, they're like, what are we doing here? You know, we never had this 35 years ago. So they're sitting there. So what we do is we have one of the teachers up teaching a class, and the rest of the class seated in, 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 on, on chairs, uh, other teachers seated on chairs. So I go in, and my goal is to shoot as many people as I can. When I entered the door, the bean bags started flying, the tennis balls started flying, and the gym teachers obviously were throwing them a little harder than most because they had something to prove. But, uh, <laughs> and then the next thing you know, I'm getting a crap beat out of me by these batons. And I'm like, and I'm waiting for the whistle, <laughs> and there's no whistle. And all I hear is the security director laughing so hard, he can't blow the whistle because the two people that are beating me with those batons are these two older ladies and they're, they're waylaying me. And I can't, and I, and I mean, I, I got off a couple shots, but none of them hit anybody. Why? Because I couldn't shoot accurately. They were throwing things at me. I'm getting hit with a stick. They swarmed me. Um, but afterwards, they came up to me and said, you know, Sergeant Clements, he, she said, I want to thank you because I never thought in my life that I would be able to do that. And you sort of get into that fight or flight instinct um, where it's either... It's going to be me or them, and they got into the, it's going to be me. So after yelling at the security director for not blowing the whistle, um, you know, it, it sort of made me think, realize, and it made the people in the room realize that you'd be surprised what some people are capable of in that fight or flight instinct. There again, handguns are fatal in 10% of the shootings. To put it another way, if you're unfortunate enough to be shot by a handgun, you have a 90% chance of survival. This is not the case in school shootings. The reason is because in most school shootings, the victim cooperate in their own murder. They all huddle in the corner. They rely on a contractor-grade lock, basically. You know, if, if you're building a school and, and, you, and the, the school says, the contractor says, well, we have these locks that are $900 a piece, and you need 1,000 of them, or we have this $25 one that's, you know, you know what, which one do they choose? It's a budget thing. It is what it is. So what we're saying is, don't rely on a contractor-grade lock. Take, take some stock in your own survival. Um, uh, Cho, the shooter from Virginia Tech, he actually practiced shooting. He put targets on the ground and had two gun handguns, and he'd walk and shoot at the targets on the ground. Why? Because he knew that's where the people would be. He knew they wouldn't be up and running. He knew they'd be on the ground, and that's where all of his targets would be. So we don't want you to cooperate in your own murder. We want you to say, look, if he's coming through that door, with a gun. I'm going to throw everything at I can to distract him, to take him from shooting accurately to just basically shooting. That's Cho. That's the shooter from Virginia Tech. There again, by contrast, 80% of the rounds fired by trained police officers in a shootout miss. These are police officers who've received hours and hours of formal training with firearms. Why the disparity? Because police shootings are dynamic, school shooting targets are not. Meaning, if there's a, there's a, uh, excuse me, I'm losing my microphone. There's a uh, Florida school board meeting. If you, if you type it in, Florida school, school board meeting shooting. There's a gentleman um, that comes basically in a room like this, and they're set up with rows like this. And he comes in with a gun because he's mad because his wife got terminated from her job at the school district. The first thing people do even if they're on the end of the aisles, instead of running, what do you think they did? They got down in, the, down in, the, down in, the, in between the seats. Um, is it harder to hit a stationary target or a moving target? A moving target, right. So 
that's part of what we're saying too. It, there again, the disparity, police shootings are dynamic. You know, the bad guy's not laying on the ground when I get there to shoot him. Now that number's not me, by the way. I don't, I, I, I hit, I, it's not me, that's other guys. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, I'm the exception to that, you know, just so you know. But anyway, police shootings are dynamic. You know, they're, we're shooting, they're shooting at us, we're shooting at them, they're moving, we're moving. So 80% of our rounds miss. As compared to an active shooter, everyone's back in that corner. You come in, someone comes in with a gun, what do you do? Do you duck down? Do you, you know, if I come in here with an airsoft gun right now, and I say, throw whatever you can at me, you're going to come up with a lot of stuff, all right? <laughs> Whether it be water by hymnals, right? <laughs> whatever, whatever you got, right? But that takes me from shooting accurately to just shooting, okay? And move. Get to the nearest exit. Uh, like I said, you can't prevent these 100% unless you make the building a prison. Unless everybody has to come through a metal detector. Everybody has to come through one door. It's not a church at that point. So what we're saying is, is distract the shooter. Distract the shooter with everything you have. We talked about this already. This is the Florida School Board meeting. I'm not going to show you the video, but if you want to look it up, it's online. Um, fortunately, luckily, the only person that, that gets uh, shot in the end was the, the man with the gun. Um, but once you watch this, you'll see the people in the audience, and you're like, why are they doing that? There's two ladies that are sitting closest to the camera. The, the, the way it works is the board's sitting up here. The guy walks right down the aisle, comes over to the side of the building, side of the room, and gets a spray can out and spray paints a big V for vendetta on the wall. And everyone's sitting there going, huh, oh, that's odd, right? <laughs> and they're all saying, well, that's, that's, that's new, right? So they're just sitting there during this whole thing, not doing anything, right? Then the gun comes out, right? And the gun comes out, and you'll, if you watch the video, you'll see on this end, there's two ladies sitting there. What do they do? Instead of getting, in, getting up and running, the one lady gets up, she puts her purse on her shoulder, she grabs her jacket, throws it over her arm, and they casually walk out. <laughs> and you're thinking, boy, if that were me, I'd be running. But if you watch the video, you'll see a lot of things that happen on that video where once we do this training, people are like, why'd they do that? Why didn't they just, if I'm close to a door, get out the door? You know, leave your personal belongings too. There you go. We talked about this. Move. Scatter. Overload the violent intruder's thought process and his physical act of shooting. And there again, what we talked about too is swarming. Um, meaning if I come through that door and I start shooting, there's a good chance that the people in the back of the room are going to be the first ones hit. Right? So the choice is, do I sit there and wait to be shot, or does everyone in that back row run towards me? It doesn't seem natural, but, you know, it's better than just getting under the seat and just waiting, waiting for the police to get here. As you move, run fast and get to any exit you can. Go out through doorways and windows, any way at all to get you out of that room. As you move, keep throwing things at the violent intruder, yelling and screaming and overloading his senses. I'm sure they prefer that you go through the clear glass, not the stained glass, all right? <laughs> right, we good? It's good, all right. That's my disclaimer. <laughs> um, but the goal of evacuation during an active shooter is taxes to minimize the number of potential victims within the crisis zone. So if it's happening on another floor and you know that you're getting that real-time information that the shooter's here and you can get out, evacuation is always the best. Bottom line, if you're not here, he can't kill you. Moving mass numbers of people during this type of event may seem con contrary to conventional wisdom, and it is. At Columbine High School, over 700 kids fled on their own initiative once the shooting started. Over half the school students saved their own lives by fleeing the area. They didn't have to have a teacher to tell them. Trust me, I have a 17-year-old, and he doesn't wait for me to tell him anything. Um, but you know, if you have a teacher, they just said, they, they knew instinctively. And Columbine was the first big event that happened where policies and procedures started changing. You know, they did the lockdown. The, you know, if you, if you read, the, read about it, the library. The library had seven different exits that the students could have gone out of. But the librarian told them what? Our policy is get under the desks. Get under the desks, and unfortunately, some lives were lost because of, of that po policy and procedure. So now what we're saying is, look, it's either going to be run, hide, or fight um, are the three options. 
No authority figure told them to, they just knew instinctively it was safer to run away. Think about the building you're in. If an active shooter's at one end of the building and you're at the other end, would it be safe for you to stay where you are until the police arrive? Or would it be safer for you to leave the area in the opposite direction of the intruder, get behind police lines as quickly as possible? If the situation provides staff, students with a distance from a shooter, you should maintain that distance. Don't let the shooter reach you and your kids or your people in the building before the good guys do. There again, just an example. If the shooter's down at this end of the building and these people up here get the alert, should they lock down or should they evacuate? They'd obviously better, be better off evacuating as compared to these areas right in here would be better off locking down, doing an enhanced lockdown because the gunman's right there. So what it does is it takes it away from a, simple, a straight policy of everybody does this to decision making. It lets you guys make your own decisions. It lets staff members you know, help you and assist you and say, look, come with me. There's a lockable door over here. This is a very secure room. Come over here. We'll fit as many people as we can in this room and we'll lock it and barricade it. So what I'm saying is also know your surroundings. Know, what, know the layout of the building. That If you're in one floor and all of a sudden it kicks off, what am I going to do? Where would I go? Where's the closest lockable door? Where's the closest area that I can hide? Um, you know, it's funny when we, we do, sometimes we'll do fire drills, and fire drills, it's very regimented, right? The kids all line up, they march out single file, they get away from the building, and then they do what? They take attendance, right? So what we started doing was saying, okay, what we did was we put these cardboard flames here and said, the students came out and the teachers came out and said, okay, this hallway's on fire, where do you go? What do you think they did? We have no idea. Because they were so set in that policy and procedure, they weren't thinking outside of the box. And what we're saying is, you gotta think outside the box. If this hallway's on fire, but this is your normal exit route, they had no idea, they, they, no independent thought as to, well, if it is on fire, that's always the way we go. <laughs> so what we're saying is, give them some independent thought saying, look, if I'm a teacher at this end, I don't have to just lock down. I have a decision. I can either evacuate my students or barricade and lock down my students. Same thing goes with the church. If you're in a certain area of the building, know where the lockable doors are. Know where the safe areas are. That, you know, it would take a shooter a little time to get to you. We talked about this. And that's where the prior training comes in. There again, you may, if you're in charge of a, a Sunday school, you may have to give your kids permission to break the windows. If you do not tell them it's okay, they will not. At Virginia Tech, two classrooms suffered near 100% casualties because no one went outside, no one broke a window. They locked the door and stayed in there and hoped, hoped the police would get there. An adjoining classroom lost only two people because the professor, professor uh, that's uh, Professor Labrescu, ordered his students to go out through the window. He, he told his students, break the window. They were on, a, on an upper floor, not too high, but high enough to where they break the windows and they started lowering each other out the windows. Uh, Professor Labrescu, um, him and another student were, were shot and killed in the room because they used their bodies to barricade the door and the gunman was able to shoot through the door. Uh, Professor Labrescu was a Holocaust survivor. The lessons we learned from Virginia Tech. Uh, when Cho came in, he entered the hallway here he went down to this hallway, into the hallway, into the building. He had a gym bag with chains and padlocks in. He chained and padlocked the door so the police, it would take the police longer to get in. Um, he put a sign on the, bomb, on, the, on the window door that said, do not enter, there's a bomb in the building. Teacher came up, saw the sign, came to this entrance, she was trying to get in the building, saw the sign, went to report it, and in the meantime, the shooting started. Like we talked about, remember we talked about that high hit rate that active shooters have. He came in here, his first person he shot and killed him in the hallway. He went in room 211. There again, look at the numbers. 19 present, he was able to shoot 18 of them. He then went across the hall to room 206. 14 people present, he was able to shoot 12 of those people. He then went to room 207. Out of those 13, he was able to shoot 11 of those. He then went to room 204, Professor Labrescu and another student used their body to barricade the door while other students jumped out the window. The wounded were ankle and wrist injuries from being lowered out of that window. Um, they weren't shot, they weren't hurt by the intruder. Um, he then went 
to room 205 and could not get in that room because the students in that room barricaded the door. He kept trying and trying, he could not get in the door. So what he did then was he went back to room 207, tried to get in there, and the people that were still able to barricaded the room and he was not able to get in that room. So the lessons we learned from that were passive, 28 fatalities, versus two from being proactive, meaning not just locking the door and waiting for the police to get there, barricading the door, doing something to, to help in your own survival. Where do we evacuate to? Some places do have an off-site evacuation location, and I'll be talking to the people uh, with the church in, involved with that. Most of the off-site evacuation locations are for if you have students, so that the parents know where to go, and, and we know where to take. With adults, you're just going to be going. <laughs> you're going to be going. I always, you know, if, if it happened here, you, you'd probably see me running down by you know, KFC on, on Hershey Park Drive. I'd still be running. But, you know, we really don't have, it's not necessary to have an off-site evacuation location, but when you're dealing with children, it is. We want the children and the staff to take people to a certain location. With adults, there's really no, you just get out of the building. If you're evacuating, get out and keep going. Off-site evacuation lo location is a predetermined location where everyone should evacuate to. Remember, you're the first, you're the real first responder. Threat continuum is recognize it. it know, when, know it when you see it. If something's strange, you know, it goes back to that. If you see something, say something. You know, the, 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 the thing you see everywhere. If you see something strange, like I said, you know, people always, we go to an alarm, and it, it's a building alarm, and it's a false alarm. And they always apologize. Sorry, I pushed the button. You know, I would rather respond to a false alarm than a real one. Same thing here. You know, if you see something suspicious and you sound the alert, we'd rather respond, check it out, if there's nothing going on, it's nothing to worry about, we're fine. You're not going to upset us. So re recognize the threat when you see it. Assess how bad can it be and respond. Know what to do in response. And there again, when we teach this, we're not just teaching it as if it happens here at church. We're teaching this as if you're at a Batman movie premiere. If you're, you know, like I said, this stuff's happening everywhere now. You know, if you're in a mall and the shooting starts, you know, start looking for exits. Start looking for you know, running in businesses and getting behind the counters, getting behind, you know, there was a one shooting in a mall where the, the, the employee knew enough. She heard gunfire. The first thing she did was pull down that gate, locked down the gate, locked it, and everyone went back in the storeroom, barricaded themselves in the, in the store, and the gunman couldn't get to them. There again, adults are always the first targeted victim because the adult represents the control and authority. If they eliminate that authority, the victims and students are much easier to deal with. These school, what do these school violence events have in common? They're all stopped by educators and students who didn't just, you know, get under the desks and wait. You know, the one, the one intruder was actually attacking with a knife. He had stabbed 14 students, which, you know, you find hard to believe. How does a person stab 14 students before someone stops him? Uh, a member of the football team and a teacher tackled him and, and stopped him from, uh, from doing this. So they, they, were, they were in that fight or flight mode. They, they thought, I could either run or I'm next to be stabbed, so I have to do something. And that's that whole counter portion of the training. Uh, we teach schools to set, how to set up their rooms. You know, uh, this came from, this, this, a school actually gave me this. They, they stacked the bookshelves up against here, and the teacher said, well, if someone comes through this door, I'm just going to start knocking bookcases over to block the door. So they sort of set their rooms up, even though this was a door that wasn't able to be locked. They said, if I push that, if I push that bookcase over in front of the door, it's going to slow him down and give me time to, to take care of my students. How long will you be in lockdown? Doug Saunders bled to death in three hours while in lockdown at Columbine. So what we, we have, a lot of the te teachers have first aid kits in their room. They have uh, drinks. They have food. They have stuff just in case they're going to be locked down in that room for a long time. And there again, it depends on the size of the building. It would not take us long to clear this entire building. But if there was a shooting at the Hershey Lodge, it would take a long time to clear that entire building. So first aid. We have a program. We have a program that we also offer. And you guys will notice probably that uh, a, a lot of places, do you guys have AEDs here? Uh, so you guys have AEDs here. So what we're doing now is, is there's, the new program is called Stop the Bleed. And, and it, it tells you how to, uh, if there's a, an injury, whether it be from someone being shot or whether it's just someone in the kitchen 
has a, has a you know, ends up cutting themselves. Um, along with the AEDs now, we're, we're putting tourniquets and, and com we call it combat gauze to stop the bleeding um, until EMS personnel arrive. So that's a new program too. And there again, we'll be offering that to the church. It, it'll be a supplemental thing if you want to come in some evening and see how it's done. Um, just in case something does happen. And there again, it's good to, if, if it's around your house to know what to do um, if somebody, you know, cuts themselves. Uh, but first aid is another thing that, like I said, we're going to talk about with the church and discuss, uh, you know, maybe putting those stop the bleed kits with, along with the AEDs and having them available in case something does happen. Um, all of our officers carry tourniquets on their person so that if, if someone, one of us is shot um, or, or a civilian is shot, that we can render uh, first aid, life-saving first aid before the EMS gets there. We talked about this. Other points to keep in mind, we talked about swarming. Contact with law enforcement. If we get here, our adrenaline level is going to be up to here, <laughs> all right? Because, um, you know, we're, we're responding to a shooter, a shooter inside a building with, with possibly mass casualties. So what do you do with, if you make contact with law enforcement? If I come into here and you're in here, the biggest thing you can do is have your hands open and empty. Open and empty. Don't have a cell phone and say, I'm on the phone with 911. All right? Not a good idea. Um, so, you know, keep your hands. If you have contact, once we get here, if you have contact with the police department, open hands are what we want to see. Um, we, may we may tell you, look, it's safe to go out that way. Go out that way and get, run. We want you to just keep your hands open the entire time you're going in case there's other police officers coming in. Um, if you end up swarming the individual, what do you do with his weapon? Um, there again, when we get here, <laughs> we're looking for a guy with a gun in his hand. Um, so, you know, if you hear the police are coming, you know, you may want to, if you can tie that person up with whatever, I don't care, your belt, computer cords, whatever, and put that gun down or at least be away from the, sh the shooter when the police arrive. But the big thing is the open hands. We talked about presenting it to students. Um, change, what the change was. Prior to Columbine, and, and, and the, the police department at Columbine took a lot of heat because they waited outside. They, and if it would have happened here in Hershey, police procedures back then were all the same. We wait outside, we surround the building, we wait for the SWAT guys to get there. SWAT guys are usually 30 to, 30 to an hour till they get there. All right? Police response for officers is anywhere in the township, because we're, we're all set in zones, you're going to have a police officer here in less than three minutes. That's max, three minutes max. And we're pretty fortunate, you know, because when you look at the nickel mines, the Amish schoolhouse, some of their response times were a lot because they're, they're spread out through, over the county. Our, our officers are spread out through the township. But prior to Columbine, that's what we'd do. We'd surround the building and wait for the SWAT team. Now, the first officer on scene is going to be coming in. They're not going to wait for the SWAT team. They're not going to wait for anybody. And our main job when we get in here is to eliminate that shooter. It's not to render first aid, because if I stop and help one person, the shooting's still going on. Um, our main focus when we arrive here is to eliminate the shooter, and then secondary is, is to start getting people out that are injured. Um, but all we, our, our, our tactics have changed. I, I'm in charge of training all of our officers on basically from a patrol officer to a SWAT guy. I, I'm responsible for training them if, how to, when they come in a building, what to do. Uh, we have different equipment now. We have breaching tools. Um, because why? Because we learn from other places' mistakes. The officer in Virginia Tech where the door was chained, he said I had two choices. He said I was either going to shoot through the door or I was going to get in my car and drive the car through the door. He said, but my car was 30 yards back, and I'm at the door, and I can hear shooting going on. He ended up shooting through the door, and that's when Cho saw, saw and heard the police and, and took his own life. So we have tools now that that are bolt cutters, that are door rams in, in all of our cars. We have ballistic shields. We have all this equipment in our cars now um, that's designed so that when we do get here, um, we have all the equipment we need. We're not going to stand at a door and go, we can't get in this door. How do we get in this door? So that's how our training has changed. And there again, sheeps, wolves, and sheepdogs, which are you. Um, I have a quick video. It's a run, hide, fight video. It's not gory or anything, um, but it, it gives the basics of what we just discussed. You know, I used to worry about getting shot and run over by a car. 
Now I worry about my PowerPoint doesn't work. <laughs> but fortunately, I have some help. Fortunately, I have some help here. <laughs> you want the mic up there? You got one back here? It may feel like just another day at the office. But occasionally, life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. But sometimes bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. The warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. find yourself in the middle of an active shooter event, your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you are out of the line of fire, try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. If you can't get out safely, you need to find a place to hide. Act quickly and quietly. Try to secure your hiding place the best you can. Turn out lights, and if possible, remember to lock doors. Silence your ringer and vibration mode on your cell phone. And if you can't find a safe room or closet, try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm. As a last resort, if your life is at risk, whether you are alone or working together as a group, fight, act with aggression, improvise weapons, disarm him, and commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. to be aware of your environment. Always have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. 
They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. Your actions can make a difference for your safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. Okay, that was a simplified version of what we discussed. Um, but what we want you to do if you leave here today is just think of what if it does happen, where can I go? What can I do? If I'm downstairs or upstairs, where's that closest lockable room? Where's the room I could go to if I have to? If someone does start shooting, where can I go in, the, in this building that's safe? What can I use to barricade the door if I do go in this room? Does this room have a lock? Is that, it's all things that, you know, just knowing your surroundings and sort of being aware of your surroundings is what we want you to do. Um, and hopefully, after this today, it makes you think a little, and usually that's what I get from people. Is it? May, it sort of makes me think, um, and that's our goal. That we don't, we don't, we hope it never happens, but we want it in the back of your mind to know what to do just in case it does. No matter where you're at, if you're at the mall, a movie premiere, wherever, um, you know what to do. So thank you again for having me. I appreciate it. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be here afterwards.